again, spend a lot of time talking about the Lord's Supper. Primarily, our text was 1 Corinthians 11, and I'll make mention of that. We'll go there a couple times tonight as well. Um, I talked about in Sunday school, if you remember, the breaking bread, the idea of breaking bread. And as I'm studying and, and considering what some other people say about the Lord's Supper, oftentimes they speak about this phrase, breaking bread, and uh, we talked about in Sunday school last week that not every time they got together to break bread do I think that it was a ceremonial celebration of the Lord's Supper. Honestly, I think that was just a part of daily life is, is they have to eat. And so they'd eat together in fellowship like we like to do. Uh, but obviously there were some times that they would get together and there was, it was for the taking of the Lord's Supper. And so then uh, on... The morning service I preached on, uh, let's see, whose supper is it? Obviously, it's the Lord's Supper. And so there were some things I talked about that might come up again tonight, but some things I talked about as far as closed communion or should we have alcohol, alcoholic wine or non-alcoholic wine, all these little things that everybody in here already knows how we do it. But the point that I just wanted to make in that message was that it's the Lord's Supper. We should worry about what's most fitting for the church and bless, blesses the Lord, not what our preferences are or what we want. So we allow a little bit of uh, flexibility there because from one church to a, another, they might have a slightly different interpretation. The Bible's not actually that super clear on how we're supposed to do the Lord's Supper. Um, I just realized it's kind of a mess in there. <laughs> so just put that uh, aside. Uh, anyway, so... <clears throat> So we'll talk about that a little bit, but, but tonight, oh, and then I talked about at the night service, I talked about examine ourselves, okay? So I talked about what the Bible uh, refers to is examine ourselves and how we got to examine ourselves before we can allow others to examine us and most importantly for the Lord to examine us. Uh, and then I preached that, yeah, I preached that in the evening service. Tonight, we're just going to go through this study and just kind of lay out some basic principles of the Lord's Supper. And what we're going to do is use that uh, going to the gospel accounts of the Last Supper. Okay, so let's get started. The clearest reference we have to the ordinance of the Lord's Supper being practiced in the early church is found in 1 Corinthians 11. Now, interesting, all the things that people do, Catholic Church and different Reformed or uh, Protestant denominations, there's no biblical precedence for it. It's just ceremonial things that they've picked up through tradition and it's been passed down. And I've mentioned this many times, but it seems like there's this, this push for in religion today, Christianity, not true Christianity necessarily, but, but this religion of Christianity that just begins to, to look like this beautiful religion where people, uh, you know, went to the monasteries and they sang the chants and they wrote all these wonderful theological uh, dissertations and and people kind of point to those things and they read those and they say, oh, how beautiful. And we need to go back to these early teachers of the Bible and see what they believed. And, and really there's a problem with that because it's not Bible. Just because it's older and some people might say, yeah, but this writing or that writing is in the first century, second century. You know, that doesn't mean anything because Paul was talking about all kinds of corruption that would come into the church. And so, you know, this idea of the Lord's Supper being a sacrament that we need to take for our salvation, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I already did on Sunday, but, you know, there, there's nothing biblical about that. And, and some of the specific practices that they go through in order to do it, or the frequency when they do it, or the fact that they do it every time. Like, none of those things are in the Bible. So, you know, we want to be careful to only study what the Bible says. And really, the only clear place that we find it is 1 Corinthians 11. And in that passage, Paul references the story of the Last Supper, you know, when Jesus sat down with his disciples and they had this Lord, the Lord's Supper, and he describes the breaking of the bread and all that kind of stuff. And we know that that's a reference to that specific story. Uh, now, here's an interesting thing. In 1 Corinthians, who's writing? Paul. And your next blank's there. Paul was not present at the Lord's Supper. Everybody probably knows that in here. 
Uh, he's considered one of the apostles or the apostle out of due time, I mean, uh, uh, out of due time, but he was not there with the, with the 12. He wasn't there whenever they sat down and did this, which means the story was told. And of course, we get it in all accounts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John all talk about that Last Supper. And so obviously the Apostle Paul had been taught that this is what the Lord did whenever he took, when they took uh, uh, that supper. And probably they went through that every time they took the Lord's Supper. You know, they, our Lord broke the bread. He said this and he did that. And so it was passed on. And so it makes sense that we would continue to pass it on uh, to people. But we don't have a lot of details as to what the specifics are about how we do it. And quite truthfully, that's not even that important how we do it or how often we do it or any of those things. All right, so, uh, so he must have had this taught, this ordinance taught uh, and explained to him about the Lord's, the Lord's Supper. Okay, now the last, the, the last Supper, as we read that time when Jesus sat down with the disciples there, it was a celebration of the Passover. We talked about that a little bit on Sunday as well which is practiced in, okay, go back to the Old Testament time. Now, why were they taking the Passover? It was in remembrance of the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, okay, or the Israelites, whatever you want to call them, coming out of Egypt. And, of course, we know now that it was a picture of the coming sacrifice of Jesus, of the Messiah. So let's go to, and, of course, Exodus 12 tells the whole, point, uh, the whole Passover story, uh, but let's go over to Deuteronomy 16. And remember, Deuteronomy is like called like Dudo has to do with two, right? So this is like the second telling uh, of the story, the second law, or how, however that, whatever that word means exactly. We understand that much what we, of what we read in Deuteronomy is just a retelling of uh, the, the laws that God gave Moses and all that stuff. So we can compare Exodus and Deuteronomy uh, as kind of parallel passages, and they give us a lot of understanding about what's going on. But look at Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16. He says, Observe the month of Abib and keep the Passover. Of course, Abib is, um, it's not an exact trans. it's not an exact uh, reference. I don't know how to say it. It's, it's basically our April, but I wouldn't say it's an it's exact equivalent to April. But anyway, it's the, by the Jewish calendar, Abib falls in line with our, our April. Okay, and keep the Passover unto the Lord thy God. For in the month of Abib, the Lord thy God brought thee forth out of Egypt by night. Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock of the herd in the place of which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. Thou shalt eat no leavened bread with it. Seven days shalt thou eat unleavened bread therewith, even the bread of affliction. For thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt in haste, that thou mayest remember the day when thou camest forth out of the land of Egypt all the days of thy life. And there shall be no leavened bread seen with thee in all thy coast seven days. Neither shall there be any, uh, anything of the flesh which thou sacrificest, the first day at even, remain all, all night until the morning. Thou mayest not sacrifice the Passover within any of thy gates, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. How far did I have to go? Just verse 3. Anyway, <laughs> you see the point. All the days of thy life, I was supposed to stop there. Uh, they're supposed to be celebrating this and thinking about this. And, of course, when Jesus comes, he fulfills all this. He fulfills everything in the Old Testament. Jesus said, you know, I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And surely he did. Some things haven't been fulfilled yet, but this ceremony was fulfilled. And so, he, uh, so this is something they continued to do, but they were looking forward to, I mean, they were looking to God bringing them out of Egypt, but then in a sense also, it's very, very clear that they were, it was a picture of Jesus who was going to be the lamb, he's going to be the Passover lamb that was slain. Uh, so at this supper now, the last supper, when Jesus sits down with his disciples, Jesus initiates a new ceremony that would be done in remembrance of Jesus. Now, again, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about that. He says, do this. You know, he refers back to that. and He says, Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. 
And he said, as oft as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. So obviously it's something that church is supposed to do at whatever frequency. Of course, uh, we've got our thoughts on what, how to best do that. Uh, but whatever the case, you know, he says, as oft as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. So it's obviously a ceremonial type thing Jesus has instituted. And, it's, and, he, and he's clearly setting something new. So he's not saying, hey, continue taking the Passover in remembrance of me because he's doing something, uh, something different here. And then 1 Corinthians 11 talks about it in a different uh, context. This appro appropriately fulfills or takes the place of the Passover in what becomes called the Lord's Supper uh, for all who believe in the gospel of Christ. Okay, not Jews. Uh, that's not the point. There is neither Jew nor Gentile. If, if somebody's saved, they're saved. It doesn't matter what their ethnicity is. And so there's really no reason even for Jews to take Passover. Some, uh, there are some Christians that say, oh, no, the, the Jews are still supposed to take it because they're supposed to take it forever and ever and ever. It's an ordinance forever. Okay, well, no, it was been replaced. I mean, all, all the promises to Israel, you know, number one, many, uh, many of them were conditional. But all of them, they've been fulfilled. They were just fulfilled through Christ. And, the, and now there's kind of like a continuation through, uh, through the church, uh, those who believe in Christ, I should say, believers, uh, there's kind of a continuation of God's plan. Now, we're not Israel. We're not, you know, we're not, we don't have flesh and blood of a uh, uh, line of Abraham, but none of that matters. I, you know, does somebody who's 90% who's Jewish, get some special blessings if they get saved because of the fact that their blood, what's in their blood? No. What if, what, you know, I might have an ancestor who's Jewish. What if I got a, uh, a fifth? I don't know, how does that work? A fifth. <laughs> you know, everybody's got like, six, everybody in here is like 16th Indian, right? And that how it goes. <laughs> what if I have like a 16th of Jewish blood in me? I mean, do I, does that put me does that make me higher than anybody else? God's not a respecter of persons. That's never really mattered, and it certainly doesn't matter now. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. We're all in Christ if we're believers, okay? So Jesus is telling us to continue on. It's not like, okay, now Christians who are Gentiles, now you do the Passover, and the Gentile, I mean, and the Jews, you know, who are believers, they're going to do the Passover. That doesn't make sense. And obviously the disciples were Jews, and obviously a lot of people in the early church were Jews. So I don't believe there's any place for the Passover celebration anymore. I see people doing it all the time, even Baptist churches, say, hey, we're going to take the Passover, and it's just you know, a good way to, uh, to remember these things or whatever. I know a good way to remember it. Take the Lord's Supper. <laughs> That's what the Bible says to do. All right, so uh, I believe that it appropriately replaces or fulfills the Passover, and it's something that we're supposed to do. Now, again, doesn't mean that we have all the details as to how to do it, uh, but we are to do it. Now, the accounts of the Last Supper, and we're not going to go back and forth that much and read these. I'm just going to, you know, I've written them all out, but there's only some places that we're going to turn to. So you might wait for me to tell you where to turn before you turn there. But Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and John 13 all tell the story of the Last Supper. Now, I'm not going to re reference John in this lesson. And the reason why they call Matthew, Mark, and Luke the synop synoptic gospels, right? And they're very similar in what they say. And then you've got John that is written very differently. And we know that the purpose of the book of John was, it was basically like a gospel tract to tell people how to be saved and to put their faith in Jesus. Uh, and there, it's a lot of spiritualism in there. And also... There seems to be, uh, there there seems to be a, a different type of calendar that's used. Like whereas the others are using like a Jewish calendar, maybe this one's using the Roman calendar is what some people say. Uh, some of the details aren't told in the same. It's not chronological. Like they're told in different order. So sometimes when you read it and try to compare it with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you get kind of confused and you're like, oh, is this contradicting? Well, it's not contradicting, and there's lots of books out there and lots of messages that have been preached trying to tie all those together. To me, it's not really important uh, to do that, uh, especially for this lesson. So I'm just going to leave that out probably, but we are going to go to John, the, the Gospel of John, but I'm going to leave that 
uh, account of the Last Supper out. But we'll look primarily at Matthew, probably. All right, so we're going to uh, think, you know, I've already taken all those accounts together and looked at them. And I'm going to pick out some different things and show you. You're certainly welcome to go study those on your own. And if you find anything different than uh, what I have here or addition in addition to what I have here, I'd be glad to hear it. So, uh, and I'm going to look at these. And using these accounts, let's look at some of the practices that we enforce during our partaking of the Lord's Supper. Number one, who should not be present? Who should not be present? Remember back in 1 Corinthians 11, you can go ahead and go there. You might hold that so we can come back and forth to it. Now remember, Paul was not at the Last Supper, but he's had certain things that were passed down to him that were important to the story and important for people to remember as they continue taking the uh, the Lord's Supper. And so he says in verse 27, Therefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this, the, this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat, of that, eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. So we already talked about examining ourselves. You know, first thing that anyone's going to want to do, and then we'll talk about this before we take the Lord's Supper, just in case. We need to make sure that we're saved. Understand what salvation is and understand that as we put our faith in Jesus Christ and that's what saved us. Taking the Lord's Supper is not going to save us. You know, being baptized is not going to save us. We are saved because of what Jesus did. And that's the, really the, the picture or the purpose of taking the Lord's Supper. And uh, we'll talk about that more in a minute. But So anyone that doesn't understand that, doesn't believe that, they shouldn't be part uh, of the uh, ceremony there. They shouldn't even be members of the church. They shouldn't be part of the church if they're not saved, right? So it doesn't make them necessarily bad people just because they're not part of the church, but, but they shouldn't be there. And, and anyone who's lost or rejects Christ, obviously they shouldn't be there. Now that brings up a, an interesting situation because Judas was there at the Last Supper. And there's been a lot said about that. And many have said, uh, you know, well, Jesus knew that he was going to betray him. and let he, he, he knew he was a devil, and he still let him there. And, and so people will say, you know, make the analogy there and say, hey, we shouldn't tell anybody who can be at the Lord's Supper and who couldn't. But that seems contradictory to what Paul's saying. So I think that we should decide who is and who isn't. Uh, Jesus must have had a reason for allowing Judas to come. Not only that, look at B there. It is possible, go to Matthew 26, it is possible but not provable. I don't think there's any way to prove it from this. But it is possible when you read all these different accounts that Judas wasn't even there when Jesus distributed the bread and the wine. Now we know he was there at the supper, but remember they're celebrating the Passover which means that there's a lamb that's cooked and they're eating the lamb and they have some kind of deal. Uh, we see that at some point Judas has some kind of bread and he's dipping it into the sop and all that kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean that that's the bread that Jesus broke and passed out in a ceremonial way. Look at Matthew 26. And again, none of this can be proven, so I'm not going to base, I'm not going to rest my case on this, uh, but I thought it was, it was worth noting. Matthew 26, verse 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? Because Jesus said, Somebody in here is going to betray me. And he said unto them, Thou hast said. And then we start another paragraph here. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Now, again, if you read the other accounts... Mark, Luke, John, you know, you could see where possibly that's where Jesus said, okay, what you're going to do, go do it. And then he left and he went out to go, you know, conspire with the Pharisees who he had already talked to, but now he's going back and he already has probably heard at the meeting at the supper, they probably knew, hey, we're going to leave here. We're going to go out to the uh, garden of Gethsemane. And, and so he already knew where they were going to be. And so he could quietly dismiss himself and go 
turn Jesus in. And after he left, perhaps that's when Jesus did the Lord's Supper. It's possible. It's, now, I don't know. Again, I can't say that for sure. So since I don't know for sure, let me go on and assume that he was present. Because we don't really know one way or, or another. But even if he was present, uh, let me back up and give you those blanks there. It's possible but not provable that Judas was not there during the ceremonial distribution of the bread and wine. Bread and wine. But assuming he was present, if someone is pretending to be a believer, but is actually what we would call a reprobate, okay, they've rejected Christ in their heart, they've been turned over to a reprobate mind, and they're just wicked people who are deceivers, and, and uh, you know, they might be sheep, uh, they might be wolves in sheep's clothing, or they might just be outright wicked and trying to get people to do sinful things. There's not much that can be done. You know, we don't necessarily know who those people are because, remember, they're lying. And they're telling you that they're somebody who they're not. And there's not really much that we can do. Now, Jesus knew, but none of the disciples knew. Um, and so there's not much that we can, we can do. But, if, but it, it, here's the thing. Here's the reason we don't want lost people in here taking the Lord's Supper. Here's the reason we don't want people who are not in good standing with the church and are supposed to be kicked out and treated like uh, treated like uh, sinners and, and publicans or whatever the Bible says, you know, because we're just supposed to treat them as unworthy if they're living in certain sins and there's just this outward show that that looks like they could care less, of, you know, they're like reprobate type behavior or whatever. We're supposed to say, hey, and, and until you can get that right and come back and, and, and be reunited uh, you, you know, we have reason to believe that you're repentant of that. And all. You know, they are supposed to be removed from the church. That's 1 Corinthians 5 makes it very clear. All right, so we don't want anyone who is in that situation or who we know is lost, they, they don't have a testimony of salvation, to take it unworthily, all right? Go back to 1 Corinthians 11. And look at verse 30, it says, For this cause... Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep, which means that they're dead. Now, even, even if, I mean, if there's a chance that, that, I mean, we don't even know exactly what that means. I mean, I've got some different ideas. I talked about that on Sunday. But, but if there's a chance that people are going to get sick or people are going to die, you know, or obviously if someone takes it unworthily and they leave here thinking, hey, I took the Lord's Supper and now I'm going to go to heaven or something like that. Well, then obviously they're, drink, they're eating and drinking to themselves damnation because they're not even saved and they're trusting in their works. But even somebody who just is, is wicked or whatever, like we don't want them to take it unworthily and then like it, it actually damages the whole church. I mean, I don't even know. Like I said, I don't even know exactly what that passage means, but there's a lot of, there's a, I go back and forth. Sometimes I think, man, I, I just want to be safe and not allow anybody unworthy to come. But here's the thing. I don't believe God's going to hold us accountable for, for letting in a reprobate who deceived us. And we, nobody in the church knew that they were living this life of sin or something like that or that they're not saved. And then they took the Lord's Supper. Like, you know what I mean? I think he would only punish us if we, like 1 Corinthians 5, like, boasted and said, hey, you know, we're just going to let that person, because we love everybody, so they're going to come in and they're going to take it, like then he might punish us, right? But if someone sneaks in like a Judas and takes the Lord's Supper, I don't think he's going to punish us. Now, he might punish that person that took it. Look what happened to Judas. I mean, Judas ends up dying, doesn't he? He goes out and he kills himself and he's full of sorrow and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, but at the end of the day, he was a reprobate. We're not really too concerned about people that reject Christ and are reprobates. We're concerned about those who trusted Christ and are part of the family of God. And, uh, concerned about those people that just need to hear the gospel and get saved. Uh, we're not concerned about what happened. You know, in fact, we kind of want them to be, be punished so that they might turn from that and say, "Man, I, God's getting a hold of me, and I better, you know, I better turn to Him or, or whatever." So, anyway. Even because of the fact that Judas was present at the Last Supper doesn't change anything about how we're supposed to handle uh, the Lord's Supper and handle the church, uh, the, the purity of the church. <sighs> okay, <clears throat> Judas knew he was guilty. This is D. Jesus knew, but the disciples did not know. 
if you remember, they, Jesus says, hey, somebody's, gonna, somebody's going to uh, uh, betray me. These disciples, they don't say, oh, that's probably Judas. I mean, that guy, we've been, we've been wondering about him from the beginning. <laughs> no. Guess who held the bag, the treasury bag? Judas. They trusted him. You know, no, you know, if you know anybody who's a treasurer, don't, <laughs> don't think that means anything. But I'm just saying that was a position of someone who's trustworthy, and they allowed him to hold the bag. They obviously didn't think he was a thief, right? but the Bible says that he was. Uh, they, they didn't look at him and say, I don't know, that guy's kind of suspicious. In fact, there was all kind of clues right there at the dinner. If you read all the accounts in the gospel story about the Last Supper, there were all kind of like, Jesus even said, hey, it's the one that dips the sop with me. And then <laughs> he dips the sop. And, uh, and, and he even, I mean, there was reason to believe everybody should have known it was Judas. But they're just like, who could it be? Was it, is it I? Is it I, Lord? Is it I? And so Judas obviously, you know, didn't come across as somebody who was a reprobate. And so, uh, so he definitely knew. Uh, and we read in the accounts, you know, Matthew 26. Let's just read that one. And then you can, if you want to study further, you can read the other accounts. Matthew 26, verse 14. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus. So you see, he had already conspired way before the, or long before the Passover uh, in, the Lord, in the Last Supper took, took place. So he definitely knew that he was going to betray the Lord. And Jesus knew because he kept saying, hey, one of you are going to. Judas says later on, he's like the last one. He's like, is it I? Maybe I'm guessing nobody else saw. Like, is it I? And Jesus said, thou sayest. <laughs> you know, yes, it is, basically, he's saying. And, uh, and so, like, Jesus obviously knew. So why would Jesus, if he knew Judas was going to betray him, why would he allow him to be part of those 12? My only answer is, for an example, for churches to know that, hey, there's always that possibility that somebody... Uh, can deceive everybody, and they can actually be a wicked person. And that's why we always judge things based on the Word of God and not on somebody's behavior, their actions, because, uh, look, saved people can do some pretty despicable things, but a lost person who is trying to deceive everybody, uh, you know, they, they might not be so easy to discern or to, or to find out. And that's okay. We just need to follow the Bible and not be deceived by these people. Okay, so uh, I believe God left him there and allowed him to do that for an example, plus it was something that had to be done for him to betray him and for him to be turned over and, uh, and willingly then Jesus goes, obviously, and is crucified. Okay, so we talked about who should not be present. I do not believe Judas should have been present in the condition that he was. Whether or not he actually took that ceremonial Lord's Supper with the bread and the wine, I don't know. But even if he did, that doesn't mean that that's who we're supposed to. And we can read 1 Corinthians 11 and get a pretty clear picture of that. So who should be present? Well, all Jesus had there with him were the disciples. Okay, And his disciples, he had a whole lot of people that followed him around, listened to his teachings and wanted to see his miracles and wanted to be fed and... Uh, you know, feeding of the 5,000, that kind of a thing. But only these 12 meet together in this upper room to celebrate the Passover. And only these 12 take that. Now, we know that some of the disciples, at least, were married because of the book, book of Acts tells us, or actually some of the writings of Paul tell us that. Uh, I'm assuming that they were married even while Jesus was, was with them. Uh, we know that Peter, it talks about going to his mother-in-law's house and far as I know, you don't have a mother-in-law unless you're married. <laughs> and so, uh, uh, you know, so where is their family? I don't know. That's an interesting question to me. I've even tried to reason in my head, like, could some of their family members have been there and they just weren't mentioned? It's just like the disciples. And it doesn't say the disciples and their houses. I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose there's a slight possibility that could happen, but I, 
I mean, it just says that the 12 were there. Okay, now look at John chapter 17. John chapter 17, starting in verse 6. This is Jesus as he's approaching that time. He's getting close to this time. He prays to the Lord. Uh, and what did I say? Verse 6, he says, uh, well, let's go with verse 5. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. A lot of doctrine there. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine, and all, and, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine. I know it gets a little bit, <laughs> almost like a tongue twister. Now, I want you to think about this before I read any further. So is he saying then that Judas was one of his and that Judas believed? Because he's talking about these guys that believed and they received the word and all this kind of stuff. So we're talking about saved people. You know, they already have faith in Jesus. They're accepting his word. They're believing in him. They're trusting in him. Does that include Judas? And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, uh, uh, Father keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou givest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So who's the son of perdition? Well, the Bible speaks about Judas as the son of perdition. The son of, he's, the, he's a man of sin. Okay, He had that place there as a reprobate. He had that place. He had that job that God had ordained for him to do in his foreknowledge, knowing that Judas would, would, wouldn't receive him. So when Oftentimes when Jesus is referring to, even after, even after Judas is dead, the, uh, in the book of Acts it refers to the 12. It's like, oh, wait, is that talking about Matthias? No, Matthias wasn't even, wasn't even elected, appointed yet. The 12 was just a title for this group. These were uh, Jesus' disciples. These were uh, these 12 apostles. Okay? That was the group. And so as Jesus is praying for them, he's like, you know, they've all kept their word. They believed in me. They trust me. I haven't lost any of them. Now, will Jesus ever lose somebody who's saved? No. My sheep you know my, hear my voice, and uh, they know me, and I know them, and they follow me, and no man should be able to pluck them out of my hands, right? Jesus isn't going to lose anyone who's saved. And he says, I haven't lost any of them. He's like, well, the, the son of perdition. Because what he's saying is like he wasn't even actually part of us. He was just, he was... He was joined with us, but he wasn't really of us. He was never really saved. In other words, that's like a that's a that's a different different subject. <laughs> okay, what I mean, so, so what Jesus was doing though was he was taking these this small group of his followers, his disciples, and he was having the Passover with them, and instituting this Lord's Supper with them. Never mind Judas. Okay, separate story. So who is supposed to be there? Saved members. Or disciples in good standing, okay, and that should be the case. Of course, we see that in First Corinthians eleven. Uh, see that in First Corinthians five. Uh, we see this uh, idea that those who are part of the church, we know that they're saved, we know they're baptized, they've been added to the church. We can vouch for all those things to the best of our knowledge, unless they're Judas. We can vouch for all that, and. They've not been caught living in any sin that should get them kicked out of the church, and so they're welcome to be with the church. They're welcome to take the Lord's Supper. Okay, this is my best understanding of what I'm reading here. <clears throat> Jesus only seems to have led, uh, in, uh, to have had this small group of disciples present. You can read all those. Uh, we already know that. Okay, number three, what are we expected to do at the Lord's Supper? Again, just based off of the accounts, the four accounts of, of the last supper, you know, the, the Passover celebration there, 
just in those accounts, here are some things that we can think about. These are the important aspects or elements of taking the Lord's Supper. Okay, number one, we are to unite together. Okay, now in this case, they all went up into this upper room and they had a full meal together. When we meet here, you know, we expect that people will have already eaten or they're going to eat afterwards or whatever, and they just we just come here for that one. Uh, you know, of course, we do it on an off day, and uh, this week, this year, like last year, it'll be on a Saturday, and we just do it as a symbolism. We do the bread and the wine. We don't have a full Passover meal. Like we're not celebrating the Passover, okay? And so, uh, but it, but in, obviously, in this original case, that they took the full meal together. We're supposed to unite together. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11 talks about that. Hey, there's divisions among you, and it's not supposed to be that way. You're all supposed to come together uh, and, and, and be on the same page. Wait for each other, he says, and, and it's supposed to be on purpose. We are to commemorate our salvation through the sacrifice of the Lord. Now, this is important. This is what the Lord's Supper is all about. We're remembering that through the blood of Jesus Christ and through his body, uh, you know, in his death, burial, resurrection of his physical body, we're saved. All that was done to save us. Okay, so to commemorate our salvation through the sacrifice of the Lord. Now, during the supper, of course, we take the bread, it represents his body, the wine represents his blood, and these are the symbols that he used at that last supper. Look at Matthew chapter 26. Matthew 26, and look at verse 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. All right? A lot of times people have a weird view of salvation, and they talk about, hey, if you want your sins to be forgiven, you need to confess them. Now, that's true, if, that's true in, in the sense that when we're saved, if we want to restore our fellowship with the Lord, we've got to confess our sins. First John talks about that. If you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your, all your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But that's talking to saved people. Okay? For somebody to be saved, it has nothing to do with whether they're righteous or not righteous. None of us deserve salvation. So our salvation is based on trusting what Jesus did for us on the cross by the sacrificing of his body and, his, and shedding of his blood these are what gives us the remission of sins. And so when we accept that, there's another part in the Bible that talks about being saved and baptized for the remission of sins. And some people are, oh, see, you got to get baptized, and that's going to wash away all your sins. No, no, no. The salvation by accepting Jesus Christ is what washes away our sins. And then the baptism is just a picture of that. Okay, so, uh, so it's, it's important. He, he talks, Jesus said that. He said, this is the blood that's shed for you for the remission of sins. Nothing in there about, well, you just got to, you know, be a good person, turn over your life and repent of all your sins and do all this kind of stuff. No, you need to receive Jesus Christ, his blood, his death, his burial, resurrection. That's what saves us. Now, obviously, taking that bread and drinking that grape juice is not saving us. It's remembering what did save us, which was the shed blood and, and body of Jesus Christ. And it's very important that we understand that before we take the Lord's Supper. So it commemorates salvation through the sacrifice of the Lord. And of course, during this supper, they used bread and the wine. Uh, let me see here. Number two under that, not the physical elements themselves. It's not the physical elements that save. Now, let me show you. I don't think I've mentioned, I mentioned this on Sunday at all. Uh, many of you will already know this, but why do Catholics and certain Protestant groups believe that Jesus' blood, I mean, the wine, you know, literally becomes Jesus' blood, and the bread literally becomes his body in their mouth, right? And this is very important. They teach this as, dog, you know, as dogmatic belief, that you have to believe this. Why is it so important to them? What's a misunderstanding of John 6? Look at John chapter 6, and there's a few other verses that they point to, but it's all out of context, and it's a misunderstanding. John 6, look at verse 48. 
I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Right, he's talking about manna. Right? Remember when the manna came down? He's like, hey, I'm, I'm like that manna. I give life. I'm, this, I'm, this bre- I'm the bread of life, he says. I'm that bread that cometh down. In fact, for, for verse 48 says, I am that bread of life. Your father did eat man in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that, man, uh, that, that a man eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which come down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's a weird thought. <laughs> but that's, they took, it's, it's just like Nicodemus. That was a weird thought whenever he said, must I go into my mother's womb and be born a second time? No, dummy, you need to be born of the Spirit. You've already been born of the flesh. Now you need to be born of the Spirit. I don't, you don't need to call someone dummy whenever you're telling them the gospel. But see, until a person's spiritual eyes are open and they put their faith in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit gives them uh, this uh, uh, acknowledgement of the truth, right? until they see that, they, they don't understand. And this is why they'll turn to the weirdest things and say that that's what's necessary for salvation. And you'll listen to people try to explain this. And if you're saved, you're like, man, this person's making it way too complicated. And if you're not saved, you're just like, well, I don't know. You got to take this and you got to be baptized. And and if you're not baptized, then you aren't truly saved. And and it's like you're just confusing verses in the Bible. Well, you got to take these sacraments. You got to take this Eucharist and, 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 and actually have. So I was reading about Irenaeus. I think that's how you pronounce it. Irenaeus. Oh, he's one of the earliest known theologians. Okay, so a lot of people ref, refer to him because they're like, we want to know what the Bible says, so let's go back as far as we can. And the earliest writings we have, Arrhenius, is like in the second century. You go, Ooh, that's close. Like he probably knows way more about what the Bible meant than we know today. But no, that's not true because there were many people that believed some weird stuff back then. And Paul was fighting them. Whenever he writes to all the churches, he's like, oh, man, these people have crept in and they're believing these weird things. And, they're, and so, like, we can't just go off man's writing and say, huh, maybe he knows what the Bible means better than, better than we do. Look, some of his wor- the Bible's words are very clear. Irenaeus said this. He said, and this is where trans- substantiation comes from, that idea that the bread and the blood, uh, bread and the wine become literal uh, Jesus' body and, and blood. He says... When they take, and he bases it off of these passages of Scripture, he said, when they take the bread and the wine, it's, it's something that's physical, but when it's blessed and received, he said it becomes spiritual. And he says, not, he says, just like that, just like that was physical and it became spiritual, when a person takes it, he's a, he's a corruptible physical man, but then he becomes incorruptible. So it's talking about like when he takes that, now he has salvation. But they don't even believe that you can keep your salvation. So you got every time you go to church, you got to take this again, and and it's just so bizarre. But this is what happens when people that are unsaved try to make sense of the Bible without a spiritual understanding that comes through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Okay, but here's where they, where they get it from: the Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, "How does this man give us flesh to eat?" Then Jesus said unto them, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you." Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my blood, flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. You can see how they take these verses. He's saying it's my blood indeed, and it's my flesh indeed. Right? But Jesus also told the woman at the well, hey, I am the living water. If you drink of this water, you'll live forever. Did, he, did, she, did Jesus actually have water coming out of his body that she drank? No, he was being s- symbolic. He that eateth my flesh, drinketh my blood, dwelleth in me, and I in him, as the living Father has sent me, uh, has sent me, and I live by the Father. So he that eateth me, even he shall live by me. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth this bread shall live forever. Okay. So anyway, they get that and they start reading into that, and then they compare other scriptures and say, "Oh, see, this, this transubstantiation." No. We are to remember that the salvation came through Jesus, not through this cracker that we eat, not through this grape juice that we eat. No salvation in it. Salvation came through Jesus alone. 
and we're just remembering that because we already have salvation. We don't need to get it again. All right. Do this. We're supposed to take this looking forward to the time when we will sup with Christ in his kingdom. Okay. So there's an element of when we take the Lord's Supper saying, hey, we are remembering our salvation. We're remembering what we're saved from, remembering who we are, and that we don't deserve to go to heaven, but it's only through Jesus' blood that we're saved. And we're going to keep on remembering this and keep on doing that, and keep looking forward to the day when Jesus comes and sets up his kingdom and we are able to eat and drink with him in that kingdom. There's an element of that that's supposed to be remembered. And, uh, and I'll talk about that here in a second. Uh, I'm, I'm closing. I really am. But look at uh, verse, uh, Matthew 26, verse 29. Matthew 26, 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. That doesn't sound like alcoholic wine, does it? Fruit of the vine? Anyway. <laughs> Until that day when I drink it new with you, in my Father's kingdom. All right, now let's look at the next part because that's this next point. And when they had sung in him, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, uh, Matthew talks about that and Mark talks about that. I can't remember about the others. But, uh, but I believe that the final idea here is that we leave in the spirit of unity. All right? Now, when we come together and we sing as a church, Ephesians 5 says, Sing, singing, uh, exhorting one another, psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. You know, this is something that is a spirit-filled thing to do, to sing Christian songs to each other and exhort one another in the Lord. And so when they left, they sang a hymn, or they sang a hymn and then they left. Now, I've said this last couple years, my understanding of the ceremonial part of the Lord's Supper where, you know, I grew up, like after we're done, we sing a hymn and then everybody leaves quietly and no one talks to each other until we're all out and then we go our separate ways and we don't dwell around talk. I've lightened up on that quite a bit because I think that's overthinking what happened here. Because if you look at this, they sing a hymn and then they went out and Jesus begins talking to them. I mean, he's preaching. He starts preaching to them. So like we could say, okay, we sing a hymn. Now let's all go to Fellowship Hall, and I'm going to sit down and preach to you for a little while. After the Lord's Supper, you know, we could do that and try to, you know, but that's not the point. I think the point was then they sang a hymn, and then the ceremony was over, and then they're just kind of back to, you know, back to regular. But I do understand where that comes from, because we don't want to just take this flippantly. And so when we're considering ourselves and we're taking the Lord's Supper, and it's a very solemn occasion, there is that sense where people all of a sudden go back to just laughing and jumping around and just and it's just like whoa do you not take seriously what we just did but here's one thing as christians and i'm done we, we can't as christians and, and this is a catholic thing too this idea of just focusing on jesus's death and 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 all oh, like watching the passion of christ and watching that and just crying and saying oh i'm so unworthy I need to go beat myself. And, and there are people that will crawl on their knees on broken glass and carry crosses up hills and whip themselves with cat and nine tail until their back rips open because they think that they're doing some kind of service to the Lord. Here's what we do as Christians. We say, you know what? I'm so thankful that the Lord suffered for us. It was a terrible thing. But you know what? He did it for us. He was buried. He rose victorious over that. <laughs> And he lives forever. And now we as Christians, we're, we find a lot of joy in that. And so we don't really need to spend our whole Saturday and Saturday night fasting. If you want to fast, that's fine. I'm not against that at all. But fasting and praying and, oh, Lord, I'm unworthy. And, and please, like, you know, just strip away everything that I have. And I, I'm just going to eat one grain of rice today. And that's it. And <laughs> I mean, there's some weird, like, Eastern, it's like Indian, you know, like this Indian uh, uh, concept of suffering and all this kind of stuff. You know, that's, that's worked its way into Catholicism and the monasteries and stuff like that. I don't believe there's a place for that in the Christian, in, in, in the Christian church. 
Like, yes, it's solemn as we think about what Jesus suffered and the price that was paid, but then we rejoice and say, praise the Lord, we're saved, he's risen, he's coming again, and when he comes again, we're going to sup together with him. And so I believe we sing that song and we kind of go out a little more joyous, than if, if, any, you know, if anything. So, all right, I took a little bit more time than I meant to. Let's pray and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the truths uh, in it. Thank you for the things uh, that we don't even completely understand, and we try to do the best that we can. I pray, Lord, however we do the Lord's Supper, and if it changes a little bit from time to time, from year to year, uh, I pray that we would, we would at least stick with what glorifies you and praises you and brings you the most happiness. It's your, your supper. We want to do it to the best of our ability, your way. So I pray you'll help us to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.